Hey guys, it's Paradise and we've been playing a ton of Dragon's Dogma 2. After having so much fun playing and beating the game and its endgame content, we wanted to wrap together our tips, advice and all the beginner's stuff that we wish we knew sooner before starting. If you are a beginner to Dragon's Dogma, we have you covered here. Of course, we won't show any spoilers, just explanations of different systems and mechanics of the game as well as some tips and tricks along the way to help you out and get a full understanding of things so you can have the best first playthrough. Make sure to drop a like below if we help you out and subscribe to show support, but also comment any tips you've figured out so we can all learn the latest tricks together as a community. We'll start off with an overview of how the class vocations work, your basic combat tips, and how pawn party members work. In the game, one of the first choices you make when making your character will be to pick your first vocation. This is this game's version of classes. At the start, you have access to four options, the fighter, a sword and shield soldier type of character, a mage who's a magical caster with different elemental spells, buffs and heals, a nimble archer with a bow and arrow who can shoot a variety of shots from a distance, and the thief, a swift rapid attacking double dagger wielder who specializes in clinging and climbing on enemies. You can change your vocation easily at any point in the game by visiting a vocation guild marked with this icon on the map. These are found in major cities and towns. You will want to regularly visit these vocation guilds as you level up your vocation to unlock new powerful skills which are weapon skills, core skills which are new combos and class features, as well as augments which are like passive traits that you can unlock and slot in to customize your character no matter what vocation you're playing. Later on, you will unlock advanced and eventually hybrid vocations giving you more play styles and options to pick to play as. But for the start, you should focus on these four starter vocations. By the way, a starter vocation doesn't mean it's just a starter class or something that you need to change off of at any point. If you like your starter vocation, these are fully fledged classes, just like the advanced and hybrid classes, it's just that you get access to these right away. Some of them are arguably even more powerful than the advanced vocations with the right player controlling them once leveled up. They each have their own playstyle and can be used throughout the entire game if you want. I advise you start off as a fighter because this is a fantastic class for learning the basics as you have access to a shield letting you block and parry which is extremely useful because not all classes can block or dodge. So as a fighter you're going to have great offense and defense which is perfect for a beginner. Now the game doesn't really explain combat and the basics to you very well, so here's a quick rundown to help you out. With all of the vocations, your square or X, depending on your controller, will be your basic attack option, and pressing this multiple times will go into your basic combo string. Using triangle or Y will do your class specific sort of special attack, which for the fighter will do an impale, for the thief will be his twin fangs, for the mage will be an AoE bubble heal, and for the archer it's a kick. For melee characters, this is best used when an enemy is knocked down, unaware or stunned, allowing for a critical strike for massive damage. Your R1 skill will be your class specific feature, which for your fighter is how you block, for your thief it's a quick dash, for the archer it lets you manually aim your shots, and for the mage, once you have it unlocked, you can do quick spell which speeds up the incant time of spells. As said, some of these need to be unlocked in the core skills at a vocation guild as you level up, and vocations gain extra functionality on various other things as you level them up too. So there are more things to learn as you progress. Holding your left bumper gives you access to your weapon skills with a corresponding button input and you can equip four weapon skills at any time. Your left trigger will sheath or draw your weapon and your right trigger allows you to pick up objects or damaged enemies to throw them or using the right trigger lets you cling and climb onto large monsters. When you run, use weapon skills or climb monsters, you will drain your stamina bar. This is the yellow bar below your HP. You will need to stand still or walk to recover this and managing your stamina is very important in combat because if you run out completely, you will have to stop and recover, making you very vulnerable. This is pretty much the basics to get to grips with how you actually play and remember, you get more core skills and weapon skills as you level up your vocation, enhancing the class, unlocking new moves and just improving the vocation as a whole. A quick tip to help you out is to complete the two side quests at the very beginning of the game 
game in the Border Watch outpost. Near the south exit, you'll be asked by a soldier to help save another soldier that went out alone and is fighting some harpies on a road nearby. Near the middle of the camp, there will be a table with a soldier that will ask you to go out and help gather some materials they need. These are very fast and easy to complete and will grant you a chunk of starting gold, allowing you to then purchase your first armor set from the merchant in this area, which will massively help you as you adventure out into the world. You can see what gear you can wear based on the vocation you're playing and the vocation icon of that gear piece. If it matches your vocation, you can buy it and equip it, and then you're going to get some extra stats. But next, you will want to understand pawns as these are your AI party members who help you out on your adventures. You have a main pawn that you will customize and create. You can choose how they look, how they behave, and what vocation they will play. You also control what gear they will wear, and you can swap their vocation just like you can your own. So pick a vocation for your pawn that will support your playstyle. For example, if you're a fighter, you might want a mage pawn in your party for those heals. If you're playing as an archer or mage yourself, you might want a fighter pawn to hold the front line for you. You then have two additional party slots with a total party size of four. With this, you can hire other players' pawns from around the world as you encounter them in the world or at various rift stones. These rift stones allow you to search for specific types and levels of pawns to hire into your party. If a pawn is higher level than you, it will cost RC to hire, which you can find by activating rift stones in the world, through other methods, and by having other people hire your main pawn into their party. I advise you look for pawns that give your party good coverage of both vocations and specializations. Specializations are skills you can teach to your pawns and they can only have one of these at a time. They do things like manage your inventory weight, highlight items on the map for you and more, so it's always good to have a mixture of melee and ranged vocations in your party and everyone with a different specialization. It's a good thing to take note of your d-pad commands because this is how you control your pawns. Pressing up on the d-pad will command your pawns to spread out and fight independently. You can also use this to tell your pawns to open a chest if you can't reach it. For example, the mage's levitate can sometimes fly up to a cliff and get a chest for you that you couldn't reach. Additionally, if pawns ask you a question or make a suggestion or discovery, you can press up for go to respond to them, allowing them to then guide you to the nearby chest, quest location, and more. Pressing down will command your pawns to come nearby you and fight by your side instead of spreading out. This is a great way to keep them following you if you're running away as well, and pressing left will have them help you, which is great to request a heal or to get a hand in being picked up after you're knocked down. Pressing right will have your pawns wait so they don't follow or attack, in case you want to try and test something out without them getting in the way. Next, let's go over your health bar, camping, and crafting. The green bar is of course your health, however in Dragon's Dogma, there's a system called the Loss Gauge. This means as you take damage, a portion of the damage will be removed from your maximum HP, while the rest of the damage will cause a chunk of your health bar to go grey. The grey portion can be healed with items or mages healing, but because you lose maximum HP as well, it means as you fight more and more over time, your maximum health will get lower and lower. This is where resting and camping comes into play. The only way to recover that maximum maximum health is by resting or camping. So after a long stint of adventuring, your maximum health is going to get quite low and you should look for a camp spot to set up camp and rest at or go and pay and rest as an inn. If you do camp, you could also cook meat at the fire for a variety of buffs that last a good chunk of time and give you many benefits. When resting at your camp, you can however get attacked and you will need to defend it. Failing this defense will result in your camp being destroyed and you will lose your camping kit, but don't worry, they're fairly plentiful and you can buy more. I personally found I didn't get attacked very often and a good tip for this is to kill any enemies near the camp so you can have a safe night's rest. When you do rest and sleep, it will pass time in the world. As time passes, items that are perishable will start to decay. Eventually, they will go rotten, making them nearly useless. Fruit and meat will eventually ripen over time, which actually enhances their effects. They can also be combined together to make Robrance a more powerful healing consumable that doesn't seem to decay. So to combine things, open your inventory and press square or X. Here you can see all of the items that are able to be combined together, and once you unlock something, it will show you all of the recipes to make that item on the recipe tab, so you can easily make it again knowing what you need. Try experimenting with different combinations, because you can get some very 
useful and strong consumables by combining. Also, rotten things can be combined together to make lantern oil, which is great to refill your lantern at night time because it gets very dark and you will want to turn your lantern on at night by holding the left bumper and pressing right on the D-pad. This activates your lantern and lights up the area around you, which is great for night and exploring caves or dark areas. By holding down the left bumper, you can also use up or down on the D-pad to quick use stamina or health consumables. Up is for health and down is for stamina. The stamina one is extremely useful when clinging and climbing on monsters. Because your stamina constantly drains when you do this, you can use this shortcut to keep topped up, which is very, very helpful. Next, let's talk about wandering merchants and enhancing your gear at vendors. In the game, you will encounter many merchants wandering through the land. Each of these characters have a unique selection of items, some selling useful things, others have quest items, and we recommend keeping an eye out for merchants that sell rings that increase your carry weight because you are limited on how much you can carry at a time. This merchant that sells a ring that boosts your strength is also very good for melee characters, giving you 50 strength, which is a lot early on. And then after you have some weapons and armor that you like and plan to keep, you might want to enhance them. At various gear vendors, you can enhance your gear for the cost of gold and eventually monster material parts as well. So collecting items that monsters drop will be very important because you need these to enhance your armor and weapons, making them much stronger. And now we have some extra tips and tricks that we wish we knew sooner and we have quite a few to get through here. First up, in the early game, keep an eye out for pawns with a quest on them to adventure for a day and night that will give you a wakestone shard as a reward. With three of these shards, you can get a wake stone, which you can use to revive yourself if you die, or to revive an NPC if they die. Wake stones are an uncommon item to get and so are very useful. So hiring pawns with this mission and reward will yield you extra shards leading to extra wake stones, which is very useful throughout the whole game. Make sure to explore off the beat and track. You will find many chests and items giving you gold and other consumables or gear, and this is especially good early, with several chests being quite easy to find, giving you gold and items. You want to avoid the water because you cannot swim in this game, and in the water is a thing called the brine that will cause you to lose HP. If your pawns or NPCs go in the water, they will die. NPCs can be revived in a morgue in the major cities, but it does cost your wake stones if this happens. If your main pawn dies, you will need to revive them by interacting with a rift stone. If hired pawns die, they will be lost and you will need to hire new ones. The game has an affinity system in it and you can give gifts to certain NPCs or vendors, although you can only increase their affinity towards you once per day. So limit how many gifts you give to a single NPC to just one per day. Make sure to mark your current quest as a priority if you want to show its location on the map so you can know where to go. If you're struggling or the quest doesn't show you, you can also try prioritizing that quest and then hiring a pawn at a riftstone that has the quest knowledge enabled as they will have completed it with their master so they can give you tips or just guide you to the location. Some quests will have a timed quest icon on it. This means it is a timed quest and the passage of in-game days and nights will eventually lock it off. So if you get a quest like this, you want to do it quickly. Furthermore, in your quest log, you can actually extend the information you can see about the quest. By opening the log and pressing X or A twice, you can see all of the details of the quest so far, as well as what you're meant to do next if you're lost or confused. Many enemies have elemental weaknesses, so you want to experiment and learn what they are because it makes a massive difference. For example, griffins are weak to fire, and if they get put on fire, they will burn and fall over, allowing you to deal tons of damage while they struggle to recover. Remember, you can move items across all of your party pawn members. If you're carrying too much yourself, you can spread this out across the party, meaning you can actually run faster, move faster, and if you become fully encumbered, you literally cannot dash or jump. So spread those items and the weight out across your party. There's a collectible in the game called Seeker Tokens, and there's over 240 of these. They're very useful because you can trade them in at a vocation guild for a variety of rewards at different milestones. The early items are actually very useful, and so it makes these worth looking for. Just remember to write down the location of the first seeker token that you find because this is important later on. Come back to this video when you figure out why and hopefully this helps you out because you want to remember that first seeker token location. Golden Trove Beetles are another sort of collectible out in the world and you can find these on trees most of the time. They're a literal big glowing golden beetle. You want to go over and pick them up then they go in your bag and you want to use them. This increases you and your pawn 
spawns maximum carry weight, which is very useful. Later on in the game, you'll start to get fairy stones and you'll unlock port crystals. These are a way to instantly fast travel. Vermund has a permanent port crystal, but later on you get portable ones that you can place and pick up yourself, allowing you to set fast travel locations wherever you want. This is very useful. You need to use fairy stones to teleport to these spots, and these are consumable, so don't expect to do this every single time. The ox carts, however, are the game's more accessible fast travel system. At major cities and towns, you can wait at an ox cart point, pay the driver, and then sit down on the cart to be traveled to set locations. You can literally sit and wait if you want, but it's really slow. Instead, you want to press triangle or Y, and this lets you go to sleep and then wake up at the destination. However, much like camping, you can be attacked along the way, and you will then need to help defend the cart. Once this is done, jump back into the cart and rest to finish the journey. Don't worry too much about being attacked, it's usually a small group of enemies or a single monster, and it's significantly faster than just walking. At the inns all around the world, you can access your item storage to place your extra gear and items you don't want to travel, and this becomes very good later on because you do get a lot of items. Speaking of items, some quests will require handing in an item, and you can actually go to the rest checkpoint town and go to this vendor, The Fence, who you can pay to create duplicate forgeries of items, including quest items, that you can then get give to NPCs instead of the real valuable one. Some quests do have consequences with this, both positive and negative, but generally it's a fun thing to do, and some quests require giving the same item in, so this is how you do that, by making forgeries. Share your tips and tricks down below so we can all learn together, and subscribe for more Dragon's Dogma 2 coming your way very soon.